Let's open in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. This evening we're going to look at one of the most sobering days of our lives as believers. 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10. On this day that we're going to read about momentarily, all the members of the Trinity, the Holy Father, Son, and Spirit are all involved. It's amazing to think about this day. We were all saved one day by God's grace through the cross of Jesus. So the Father, uh, by accepting the gracious sacrifice of Christ, allowed us to be saved by his grace. And we all live each day energized by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So the Father who allowed us to come into the family um, is, is also accompanied by the Holy Spirit who energizes us. In him we live and move and have our being, and we are energized by his grace to accomplish anything good. But this verse says that Jesus Christ has a special part. And we will all stand and have all of our days lived as believers, analyzed and tested by Jesus Christ. And that's what this passage is about. But what's amazing is the Father saved us by grace through the cross of Christ, and the Spirit of God energizes us to live the Christian life by grace. But when we come to the judgment seat of Christ, we're judged, as it says in verse 15, for our works. Did you catch that? There is this concept today that we are so much under grace that some people can live any way they want to live, and it doesn't matter because of God's grace. You're right about that until your life is over. Then it really matters because there are consequences to every single choice we make. Here, the consequences in life, the consequence engine, it says in Galatians 6, is operative, and, and we all know about that. But the consequences in eternity are huge. And that's what we're going to study tonight. This is a sobering time. For the works that we use the days of our lives to accomplish, we are going to have to answer to Jesus Christ for. So there is a reckoning. There is an accounting. It isn't that everything's erased because the sin is gone. But God keeps track of whether or not we wasted our lives. That's what you're going to see here. Because There's going to be a literal burning up. There's going to be a turning of time either into gold and silver and precious stones or into soot and ashes because it was wood, hay, and stubble. That is going to appear. And the lesson of 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 is don't waste any of the days of your life. You see, even under grace, it does matter what you do with your life. Don't waste your life is the message of God to us this evening. We need to be gripped by the reality that choices we make have consequences both now and for eternity. Only our sins are forgiven and forever forgotten by God. Wasted lives are not forgotten. Rather, they are remembered and dealt with by God at Christ Bema. That's a Greek word, judgment. It doesn't say, it doesn't say judgment in, in the text. It says bema. It means the raised platform, the seat of Christ. Remember, Martin Luther lived by a motto, and he often repeated it. I have but two days in my calendar today, and the day I stand before Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10, we find ourselves standing before Jesus Christ. Follow along in your Bible as we read 10 through 15. And think about what Jesus Christ is going to do. 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10. According to the grace of God, and Paul is talking, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones wood, hay, straw. Verse 13, each one's work will become clear. The focus of this time is our works, what we did, what you, what I, individually, not CBC, you, me, individuals, for for each one's work, verse 13, will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, 
which he has built on, it endures. He will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Very sobering words. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray tonight that you would stir our hearts, challenge us as individuals to make individual choices, little tiny choices that will have big eternal consequences. I pray that we would lessen the flammable nature of our lives, that we would lessen the fire hazard of our days as believers, that we would not pile up highly combustible things in our lives. And just as we physically guard against having uh, open containers of flammable material around near a source of fire, and we're all so careful about having uh, fires in our homes and fires in our our, uh, areas that we work in, I pray we'd be careful about equally about spiritually having combustible materials that will go up in smoke and cause us to suffer loss someday. So Lord, Stir us, uh, quicken us, energize us, get our attention, teach us what you want us to know. And when we leave here, may we forget anything except that which is by your spirit to be changed and worked upon in our lives. And we'll thank you for someday standing before your throne and remembering this night in which we made little choices that will change the outcome of what our lives shall be when our works are tested. And we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Look at verse 13, because Christ's coming, coming simply reveals what people have been all the time. Remember, his coming is to reveal what we were doing. It's to pull back the veil. Most of us can appear a certain way, but God sees our motives. That's why we're not supposed to judge one another's motives. Paul said that. He says, don't, don't judge one another's motives. Don't, don't say, oh, I know that person's motivated by you know, this or that. God is the one. He's the motive judger. We are supposed to concentrate on ourselves, what our personal works are. And verse 13 says that when we stand before Christ, each man's work will become manifest. The day will disclose it. Remember the one who has planned the end from the beginning has told us what will happen in the days ahead. And that is his plan. And remember where we are tonight, this judgment seat of Christ, is the second of the seven big events. Now I'm going to back through them in case you haven't been with us. I call these seven steps from now to eternity and we've, we're going through them backward. The last one is heaven in Revelation 21 and 22. And as I said this morning, when you look at the book of Revelation, when you open the Bible, you're actually looking at the greatest history book of all. This is the most, most beautiful history book because all other history books rely on secondary sources. This one is primary. When you, when you read the, the stories in the Old Testament, God actually recorded those conversations. They are accurate. When you look at the thoughts, God actually wrote down what people thought. And it's just a little, little insight into what the judgment seat of Christ is going to be like. Do you remember that, that, that many times in the Bible we actually have someone's thoughts? The book of Nehemiah is filled with it. If you've ever read ne- Nehemiah, it's one of the most beautiful diaries in the Bible. And Nehemiah, when he's coming before the king, he says, uh, and I thought about this, and I thought, boy, if I say this, the king's going to do this or that. And he's actually writing down his thoughts, and, and God is seeing them and recording them for us. And it shows his prayers that he didn't say out loud. And he says, and I prayed favor from the Lord with the king. And so in the Bible, this beautiful history book, we have not only the event, and not only the exact event, but we have thoughts, we have recorded words, we have even motivations and intents of the heart. But when you look at Revelation, you're looking at history that hasn't yet happened. And the last two chapters, 21 and 22, we saw are the seventh of the seven events, and that's heaven. And that is chapter 21 on, where there's no sickness, no tears, no sadness. And it's just as God intended. It's, it's paradise restored and returned. It's like the wonders of Eden, only there's no devil around tempting. And there's also, it says in verse 8, there's no liar and no whoremonger, none of the sin. It's all gone. We are perfected. And we are finally, as God wants us to be, forever his servants, worshiping him. That's the seventh event. That's 21 and 22. Revelation 20, the last half of that chapter is the great white throne. 
That's the final judgment. That's when everyone that's ever lived on this planet, and it says in the sea and Hades and everything gives up. A lot of people, when they read that in the great white throne, it says the sea give up the dead. It says, what's this? Well, have you ever thought that there might be as many as a billion people buried under the sea? You say, a billion? Oh, well, think about how long it was from Adam to Noah, and think about how long everybody lived and how long they kept having children. Remember, the Bible is history. It really happened. Those, those longevities of their lives really happened. They really did live 900 and some years. Th- that's why, you know, that little thing in Second Peter, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. What it's talking about is it's talking about God's grace and his patience with us. And the longest life anybody lived on the planet was 969 years. So what the Lord is saying is my grace will be with you for your whole lifetime. I, I will be patient for you till your last breath. I am patient. I will go a lifetime. I'll go a thousand years. God is very patient and long-suffering. That's the whole context of that passage. But those people really did live that long. And they had a lot of children. And Dr. Henry Morris, the the great Institute of Creation Research scholar, said it's very easy that there were as many as a billion people on earth before the flood. We always think, "Mm, maybe it was Noah and his neighbors. Really? I mean, where do you get all that stuff to build that huge barge? I mean, do you ever think of that? Where do you get all that finished wood and and all the pitch and stuff? He, He was buying it. I mean, there was civilization around him. He had some kind of tools. He was building that thing. And, and, and he preached to somebody, and, and so who knows how many, but probably however many there were, maybe a billion, are under the sea. And they're all going to out of the seabed, and they're going to come and stand at that great white throne, Revelation twenty eleven through 15. Then the first ten verses are about the millennium. It says thousand, 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 thousand. It really is going to happen. It doesn't say millennium, that's Latin, mille, for a thousand, but it, in the Greek, kile is where we get kilius, and the idea that we're thousand-year believers, but, or believe in the thousand-year reign, but that millennial reign of Christ is what fully a fifth of the Old Testament is about. You look at most of Isaiah from chapter 39 on is about the millennium. And most of, you know, you just read through Ezekiel from 40 to 48, those eight chapters all about the millennium. All of those promises to Israel about the desert blooming as a rose, they're only partially fulfilled now. They're going to be completely fulfilled in the millennium when when Israel is just under God's blessing. But that seventh event is heaven. Uh, Sixth event is great white throne. The fifth event is millennium. The fourth event is in chapter 19 as we're backing through Revelation. The entire chapter is about the second coming of Christ and about him righting all wrongs and and him coming and and beginning his rule with the rod of iron, as it says in chapter 2 or the second psalm. And the third event, which we looked at most in depth last week, was Revelation 6. Actually, 6 through 18 are all about the tribulation. There's different facets of it, and it's kind of like, as I told you, uh, the the unfolding of a flower, and and just as you go toward, it just spreads out, and each thing just gets more more intricate. And that's what the tribulation's about from 6 through 18, with the second coming being in 19. But that takes us to the second event that looms biggest for all of us who know Jesus. And let's go now to 2 Corinthians 5, because the judgment seat or the Bema seat of Jesus Christ is graphically described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the first 10 verses uh, really are, are, there's so much in these 10 verses that I'll just kind of walk with you through them. It kind of gives us a perspective on life. For we know this, if our earthly house, this is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. Now stop and look up from your Bibles. God looks at life on earth as camping, okay? Peter says the same thing. He says, when I die, I'm folding up my tent. Now, have you ever camped? Camping is not fun if it rains. Camping is not fun if, if there are bugs around. Camping is, after a while, it's not fun, period. You know what I mean? It just it gets old after a while. I mean, cooking and out in the fire and sleeping with lumps, unless you have all those fancy things. And that's not really camping if you have all that stuff. But, you know, I mean, real camping is not fun. And that's the idea here. He says, our earthly house, this tent. Now, just think of the metaphor Paul's saying. He's saying our body is like a tent, and, and what we're looking for is the next part of the verse. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We are looking forward to what is really life. 
I mean, if you think this life's great, you'll really like the next one to come. We, we don't even know what life is like. We are just, it, it's just barely, we're just barely enjoying what God has in store for us. So, camping on earth is a metaphor of living in our bodies. Now, if you go camping somewhere, one of the beautiful parks here, and you see someone pulling in from Home Depot carrying the chandelier toward their tent, wouldn't you go, what, what are you doing? You say, well, I'm putting a chandelier in my tent. You say, in your tent? Why, well, it's temporary. That's a waste. What are, you, what are you doing that for? Next thing you know, they're, they're digging holes through the floor of the tent. And they're putting it inside plumbing. You'd go, what are you doing? Yet, we are so much the same in our earthly lives. We, in fact, I'll tell you a little story. We went to Prince Edward Island with a friend of mine. He was a lawyer, a big investment guy, and, and he'd never camped in his life. To him, camping was going to Holiday Inn instead of Hyatt Regency. You know, He thought that was really struggling. And I said, no, 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 you need to experience this one. And so this guy made four or $500,000 a year. He went camping with us. You should have seen him. Bought everything brand new. It wasn't even out of the box. They had it all in their car. And they went with us. But the one thing I'll never forget is, to put up his tent, he bought a mallet. I mean, it was one of, you know, one of those like you see at the circus, them putting the thing in. Big headed, wooden with a handle. It looked like a wooden sledgehammer. He had that with everything else. Their car was amazing. So we got to Prince Edward Island and, you know, and we got our tent out with all of our kids and he had a whole bunch of kids and they got their tent out and they took it out of the box and ours was dirty and theirs was fresh and clean and they put it all out like this. And he got it spread out and got those stakes all in the corners. And, and Rick, my friend, took out his mallet. And I saw him and he went, <laughs> buried that one out of sight. I, it was great. <laughs> and I came over, I thought I would be kind as a good friend and brother in Christ. I said, Rick, don't pound your tent stakes that deep. I said, you will regret putting your tent stakes in that deep. I said, come over to my, and me, I was just... You just put them in just enough to keep the wind and everything because you know what you have to do before long. You have to what? Yeah. And, and you know, so I watched him. He went all the way around. He's a lawyer, a banker. He buried every one of them. They were (laughs) under the grass. We were at Prince Edward Islands and notorious rains came. And the last night it started raining right after supper and our tent was like this and we had to leave to get home to get to the ferry by 4 a.m. And so... At about 3.30, I started pushing the water off, you know, got the kids in the car and took down the tent, got totally soaked. And we were in with our wipers on and the defogger going, all warming up as we watched Rick still pulling out. (laughs) He worked for hours, or actually about a half hour, pulling those stakes out. He had buried them too deep. Now we laugh, and that's a funny story. really happened. But are you putting your tent stakes in too deep? Have you ever thought about it? Do you know why a lot of people have trouble getting ready to die? They spent life with a mallet putting the stakes in as deep as they could. And, and, and we, we act like this is all there is. John Wesley was riding around uh, in this English country manor estate of an early believer in the Wesleyan movement, the Methodist movement in England in the 18th century. And they rode on their horses for three days And they never got all the way around this Christian's estate. And when they finally cut back and went to the big house, the man said, what did you think? What did you think of my estate? And Wesley said, I think you're going to have a hard time leaving it all behind. That's the condition Jesus sees in the church, in Revelation, at the end, in Laodicea. We are rich We're increased with goods, we hardly need him, and we got our tent stakes out of sight. And it's hard to feel like we want to go to heaven. And so that's why this chapter is so important. We know we live in a tent, but we have a house, verse 1, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. Paul says, I can't wait to get there. If indeed... Having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given to us the Spirit as a guarantee. Wow, arabon, that's an interesting Greek word, actually means an engagement ring. The Holy Spirit 
is our engagement ring. We're going to be married to Jesus Christ. All of us individually are going to be married to him. We are his his bride. He is our groom. We are expectant of the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is in chapter 19 of Revelation, just before his return, because we're married to him, and then he comes back with us. The the honeymoon is coming back to earth and, and watching him conquer. But we have our engagement ring on, which is the Holy Spirit given as a guarantee. Verse 6, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now that's where that little verse comes from. A lot of people wonder, absent from body and present with the Lord, it's coming. For we walk by faith, not by sight, verse 7. We are confident, yes, verse 8. Yea, rather, please to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So there, if you're a Bible note taker, that's where the, the truth, doctrine of the Bible, there's no soul sleep. There's a whole group of Christendom that believes in soul sleep. What they believe is that the people go into an Old Testament unconscious something, you know. I don't know what it is, but they go into this, you know, the Catholics have limbo, limbus patrum and limbus infantum. That's not in the Bible, and neither is soul sleep. It says right here in this verse, to be absent from the body, the instant that you have your last, and I have my last brainwave, my last breath, my last heartbeat, that very instant... When, when, when our body falls back and is, is no longer pink and vibrant with life and our spirit is unleashed, unshackled from our body, we instantly go into the presence of the Lord. In fact, I love uh, to, to remind people, especially those dear believers who are excited and love the Lord and know the Lord as they're reaching the end of their lives. I love to remind them that Jesus has set an appointment. Remember it says... Uh, it's appointed unto man once die, Hebrews 9, after that, the judgment. What that means is each of us have an appointment for death. And by the way, uh, your vitamins and all of your running does not, does not change that date, okay? So make sure you realize there's a fixed date out there. And you can die healthy and you can die sick, but we all have an appointment to die. Now, exercise profits the body and so does good diet and we should be disciplined and all that. But don't think you're lengthening your life. Uh, God has made an appointment for each of us. Now, he's factored in his plan and his will, but we all have a set appointment that he has made with us. And on that appointment, it says in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? Thou art with me. Who's the thou in Psalm 23? The good shepherd himself. Now, put all this together. We're doing some complex math here. We all have an appointment to die. Set. In fact, Psalm 139 says every day of our life is already written in God's book. He knows exactly our duration, our length, how much time we have. He knows we're supposed to measure the days and we are supposed to redeem the days. And he has in a fixed time in this looking down, he knows exactly when we're going to die. And we have an appointment for death. And Jesus Christ comes and gets us. You understand he doesn't send an angel. He comes. Did you catch what Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. Jesus comes. So every time, like just very recently uh, in Tulsa, they called me and I ran over to see Ruth Heck. And we were there and Ruth had gone into the Lord's presence and we sat with the family and I said, let me remind you of what you already know, but I'll remind you. In all the universe, we know exactly where Jesus Christ was at 9 o'clock this morning, 9.03. He was right here because he came and took Ruth home. In fact, I know exactly where Jesus was on December 1st of 2007. Because I was at Edward W. Sparrow Hospital in Lansing holding my dad's hand. He was smiling and looking at me and had the biggest, strongest grip. And all of a sudden, he just looked off. And he let go of my hand. like I felt his hand opening up like this. I mean, he was singing with us. I mean, he was as healthy as he always been when he shoveled snow. And he just let go of my hand. And just, you know, just the classic death scene. And you know what I told the kids? I said, Dad was talking to me and holding my hand and, and just loving, worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, the Lord came by. And who wants to hold your hand when you can get the Lord's? And he let go. <laughs> And he reached out. And see, his body stayed back. But the real us, to be at, look back at what it says in verse 8. 
We're confident, we're well pleased rather to be absent from the body, to get out of this tent. Who wants to live in a tent forever? And to be present with the Lord. We actually have an appointment and death is, is, it's awful and, and we don't like it. And it's, and it's, I talked to one of the staff members, he said, it's not, it's not heaven I'm afraid of. He said, it's the process of getting there. It seems so, uh, you know, it's awful to think about dying. But in God's perspective, We have to die. Why? Because flesh and blood cannot what? Inherit the kingdom of God. We all have to either die or be changed in a moment. So either we get an individual rapture, which is Jesus coming right to where we are, in the car, you know, in the airplane, in the hospital, or wherever, at home, and he comes right to us. Either we get a personal rapture where he comes at the appointed moment and we leave our body and he takes us to be with him. Or we get the group one, which is called the rapture, which is the next event we're going to study in the future. But either way, to be absent from this body, whether it's in the Iraq war, whether it was in the World Trade Center, whether it's going to be in a heart attack this week or, uh, you know, a little slower with cancer next week, or whether it's going to be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because flesh and blood, this thing cannot inherit and enter the kingdom of God as it is. We must be changed. And so that's what the Apostle Paul reminds us. And there's no soul sleep. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But now, let's look at verse 9, because this is the actual wording of the judgment seat of Christ. It says, therefore, because of the first eight verses, because our body is a tent, and because earth is camping and heaven is home, and because to be absent from the body is present with the Lord, therefore... Remember when you study the Bible, you always ask what the therefore is there for, and it's always what preceded. There's a thought that is culminating and and built upon. And so therefore, because of those eight verses, Paul says we, speaking of all of us as believers, make it our aim. This is the goal of my life. Whether present or absent, whether I'm here on earth, alive and breathing, or I am in his presence and absent from the body to be well-pleasing to him. And then, and then he finalizes it with verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And then look at the next verse. Knowing, therefore, the terror of of the Lord we persuade men. Ooh, boy, that's pretty close to verse 10, isn't it? Verse 11 is. Did you know that the judgment seat of Christ is a terrifying thing if you're not ready for it? It's a terrifying thing if you have been buying, see our time, there's a river of time running by each one of us. It it runs at 60 minutes an hour. Okay, it's time. It just flows by us. And from that river of time, we can redeem. We can buy moments and we can purchase something with those moments. And if you're purchasing, dipping in that river of time, and if you're buying stuff made out of paper, cardboard, you're making, getting stuff made out of wood, you're buying a few straw things and piling them all up in your wagon, the judgment seat of Christ is very terrifying. Because everything that you're spending your time on it's going to burn up. And, and what's amazing is Paul just couldn't stop thinking about this. He kept saying, I know that what I do with my time is going to be tested by fire. And so he'd pick something up in life, some pursuit and some, some activity and some time investment, and he'd pick it up and he'd, he'd look at it for a while and say, hmm, boy, that's good, not sin, because I don't want to do anything intentionally to sin against the Lord. But he says, you know, that's too light. That's going to burn up. And I'm going to put that back. And he was always measuring what he purchased with his time. Now, see, we, we can't 100% live every moment uh, in, in this constant state of, of being like, you know, a martyr or something. We still have to go through life. But see, you can redeem work time, you can redeem family time, you can redeem marriage time, you can redeem school time. If you're saying, Lord, I want, I have to study. But wouldn't we love to say all that study is just 
paper and burn up. Well, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I, by the way, I was a professor for long enough. I had students that tried to pull that on me. They said, oh, no, I was praying. I said, great, good. To, but if you don't do the assignment, you get an F. Even if you are praying, you have to turn your paper into school. In, in seminary and in college, both the classes that I taught. I said, you, you should be praying, but you should be doing your work at the same time. And so we can pray and redeem time while we do our everyday work. For example, my father worked for 46 years at Oldsmobile in Lansing, Michigan, in the same building. And he had to be there at 6 o'clock every morning, and he worked until 4 in the afternoon or whatever 10-hour days they had back then. And he redeemed the time. Not every moment. He's still, he used to tell me some of the stuff he did. He created this little thing for the drinking fountain and it amplified the drinking fountain. Instead of it going, it went. And he, he, he was using General Motors equipment too. Good thing he's in heaven. But he would make these little things and he would walk around. They were just little attachments and he'd look and he'd stick it in the drinking fountain. Then he'd go over there and lean against the column and sip his coffee. And the first guy coming up would put his face. You know, you put your face right down next to that thing like this. And they would hit that and it'd go right in their ear. And he said he choked on his coffee so many times, <laughs> laughing. Now, that part will burn up. He'll be laughing and laughing in heaven. And the Lord might have a little twinkle in his eye because I can see that we're supposed to have fun. But don't spend your whole life squirting people at the drinking fountain, wasting your time. And you know what I mean. Okay, let's, let's go through the Bema Seat of Christ because there are two elements to this. Verse 9, we should have an ambition that consumes us. That's what he says in verse 9. So the first half is we should have a consuming ambition. And, and you see Paul describing that. He says, we make it our aim. It's my ambition. This consumes me. Whether present or absent, I want to be well-pleasing to him. So Paul thought about that. Everything he did, he was consumed. It's kind of like the Weight Watcher people. Do you ever see them? Once they really get into all this, they're counting. Let's see, that's a, a seven. And only have, I don't know anything about it. I don't know how you count, but you know what I mean. I think you get a hundred, and they, each one they know how many it is. And there, you see them, and they go, "Oh, I want that, but it's a twelve, and I can't get it." You know, and, uh, an apple is only four, and so they're always doing that. Now, what it is is they are consumed with the goal to get to this level, whatever it is. Paul was the same thing. He was, he was a spiritual weight watcher, or whatever you want to call it. He had an ambition that was consuming. And then, that's based on verse 10, which we'll look at, and that is an appointment that is constraining. This consuming desire for him was because he was constrained by the fact that every day he was getting closer and closer and closer to standing in front of the judgment seat the Bema Seat of Christ. And Paul thought about that. Now, you know, it could be that you think about it 10% of the time. You'll be happy that you do. Some of you might think about it 15% of the time. Boy, you'll be happy. What I'm really troubled about is the people that don't even think about it. They're just blissfully going through life, acting like this is all they're here for. It's just to have the most fun and the most comfort and relaxation and, and just go through life enjoying it all. Paul said no. No, we labor. We long for this appointment. Well, standing before Christ's judgment seat, in verse 10, I want to show you this. At the very end, it says that at the judgment seat of Christ, we will receive for the things done in the body at this constraining appointment according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Now, we only have time tonight to cover one word in verse 10, okay? Bad. Let's talk about the word bad. Because the scriptures say that when we stand in front of Jesus Christ and we bring our wagon of our lives every day of our life as a believer. Remember, every day of our life before we were saved is erased. No record of it. God can remember it no more. It's gone. It's all on Christ. He paid for it. And every sin that we've committed during our our lives as believers. That means every time in the tape of my life from 1962 through tonight, if you looked at the tape, you would see all these erase marks all the way through the tape. And you go, whoa, what's that? And Jesus would say, I don't know. I I don't remember that. Those those I bought and paid for. So, So in the tape of our life, 
every sin has been edited out of the tape. But boy, there's a lot left because most of life isn't sin. And all the rest is what encompasses our wagon that we bring to the judgment seat of Christ. Everything that wasn't sin. Going to school, just, you know what I mean, just think about everything, going to work, everything, just taking the trash out, all the stuff we do in life, folding the clothes, is all not sin. Did you fold the clothes as a young person living at home because your parents made you or because you wanted to serve in the name of Christ with no reward? Wow. Did you know you can fold clothes and get rewards in heaven for it? How about uh, cleaning your room? Did you do it? Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to go out with your friends on Friday night. Boy, that will burn up. But what if you did it because you wanted simply to be a representative of Jesus Christ and you wanted to, whether therefore you eat or drink or clean your room or whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. How, How about other sins? How about... Men, keeping your mind from drifting into tempting areas. Do you do it? Do you keep from drifting in there because you're afraid someone's going to find out? That'll burn up. Or do you do it because you simply want to please the one who loved you and loosed you from your sins, Jesus Christ? You see, the greatest deterrent to sin is love. Love. If you love Christ, you say, I Don't want to do that. It will displease him. I want to do this because it will please him. Not I have to or I'm going to or I must, you know, forced or I'm afraid. You know, perfect love casts out fear, it says in 1 John. So that last word bad is interesting. We'll do a quick word study. The word is faulon, P-H-A-U-L-O-N, faulon. It's a unique Greek word, very rarely used. In fact, it, it, it actually doesn't mean bad like in bad kakia is a Greek word, which is evil and wicked. What it means is good for nothing. It means, uh, actually it's translated many ways in the Greek uh, literature outside of the Bible. It's used for smoke, it's used for mist, it's used for steam, and it's used for dust. Uh, in fact, I don't know if we have them here, but in... Oklahoma, because of the windy plains, there are what are called dust devils everywhere. It's a little tornadic. Uh, you just walk down the street and the wind blows and all of a sudden you see a little swirl like this. And it, it's dust and sometimes there's a little piece of paper in it or a leaf and it just goes and then it's gone. That's the word foul on. Now, many years ago, I used to ride with my dad. He led expeditions to Canada, way up into Canada, and he used to drag me along, and I loved it, except I didn't like getting out of bed at four in the morning, but he would drag me out of bed and plop me in the canoe and make me sit there while he went out and caught muskies and walleyes and all this other stuff to cook for the people that were the young people on the expedition. I can remember many, many mornings shivering in those canoes, you know. And we'd be out in the middle of some big Canadian lake, and it was dark. And he'd be getting out there quietly, and he'd get his tackle all ready. And I would just be, I was so little, I could just see over the edge of the canoe, and I'd be looking like this because I had a, something I did to pass the time. I used to look across the canoe and look toward the rising sun because I knew, because I'd done this so many times, that when the sun finally rose and those warm rays came across the cold Canadian water, it produced this beautiful display of little steam wisps that would swirl as the heat and the cold and a convection occurred. And I would sit there watching, and that's how I'd pass the time because he wouldn't let me fish because I would scare them away because I was always like that. So no rod for me, just shiver and look over the edge. And I'm always grateful for that because I will remember for the rest of my life looking as a little five and six year old over the edge of the canoe and I would watch those swirls and and they would be there and I would watch them and they'd be gone. So I'd look for another one. They'd be there and it would be gone. What I was looking at is the last word of verse 10. I was looking at foul on bad. And so for for my Canadian time, I think about the fact that it's so easy in life to do something that happens, it was fun, it took place, but it had no spiritual good. I already know, 1 Corinthians 10.31, that whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, I can do it all for the glory of God. 
You know, one of the ways you do that is, if you have to eat a meal, you start by thanking the Lord for the food. Do you know what they do over in, in, in uh, Russia? They pray after the meal, too. They, they ask the Lord's blessing on the food, and then they thank him after they eat it. I mean, they really get into this glorifying him in the food time. You can do anything you want. If you do it according to God's word for his glory, he will reward us. But we know when Paul spoke of the upcoming appointment we all have with God. He used that colorful word for dust whipped up by a gust of wind on a dirty street and steam swirling on a boiling pot of water or the, the, the little swirls I saw in Canada. And what he said is, he says, at the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to be judged for what we have done, whether it was good, whether or not it was done in the energy of the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, for the glory of Jesus Christ, or whether it wasn't. That's all there is. Only two choices on the shelf. Pleasing God or doing for myself life. Tonight, we have an ambition, verse 9. And that ambition should become our aim that whether present or absent, we please him. Now here's the test. You got choices. Tonight as you drive home, as you're driving, pleasing the Lord, or not. You can get rewarded for driving or not. When you get home, what's your first choice? Is it going to be something that will be serving others in your family, your wife, your husband, your children, or is it going to be selfishly motivated, just me? As you go through the night, you can either have the last thing that your mind's going to think about all night long be the Lord or the inane blathering of some talking hairdo on television. Which is the best thing to think about on the last... Did you know your mind works all night long? It's chewing on something. What's it, what is the last thing you put in? Do you put in a little of the word? Do you put in a little prayer? If you're married, do you reach over and get her hand or his hand and say, let's pray. I'd like the last thing we do to just be the Lord. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, you know, we already know what God wants, by the way. If you read the Bible, you already know what he wants. It says in Deuteronomy 6, when you rise up, you're supposed to talk about the Lord. When you sit at meals, you're supposed to talk about the Lord. When you drive around during the day, you're supposed to talk about the Lord. And when you go to bed at night, you're supposed to talk about the Lord. Wow. God says he wants in. He doesn't want us to take off, you know, the God thing off the shelf and do it on Sunday and then fold it all up nicely and put it back where it belongs until next Sunday. He wants it out all the time. And, and that's just how we're supposed to be. And that's how the early church was. If you read the book of Acts, you find that there are over 30 different Greek words used for talking about God that were in the first century church. They just found a way to talk about him everywhere they were, at work, and when they were in public, and when they were coming here and there, and, and anywhere they were, they were, God was a part of it. You know what's on people's mind? They talk about it all the time. If you get the opportunity to introduce a subject, what do you talk about? Now, I don't mean... You know, you have to use a little common sense here. I, I mean, some people drive people away from Christ because they're kind of like the bulldozer. You know, they just like that. But it is possible to bring the Lord into every part of life if we're energized by the Spirit. This evening, the most sobering day of our life, is the day that we get to, one by one, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Next time... We're going to talk about it, just what it's going to look like, who all is going to be there, even what the seven different things God rewards and the five different crowns he passes out. I mean, wow, it's exciting. Father in heaven, I thank you for your church and for this part of your church. And I thank you that we're all pilgrims. And as a songwriter put it, we're on the journey of the narrow way. And someday, it's you who are going to sift through our life. And you're going to look at everything that we did. And you are going to put all of it through the fire. And I pray that we would make little choices tonight to get into your word and start marking the things that please you and start noting the things that don't and start making conscious, incremental little choices to be well-pleasing to you. And especially when we know that there are key things that you're going to actually pass out 
unfading crowns for those who attend to what matters to you. I pray we would be conscious of those crowns, of those rewards, of those things that are eternal, and that we would start shifting our assets in that direction, our time, our treasures, that we would start investing in what will never evaporate, that we will start investing in what will never burn up and what will last forever. I pray that we'd have that ambition to please you consuming us and that we would have that appointment where we answer for our life constraining us and that we would please you in all that we do until you come or call and we ask for that in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.